At this point, we need to go in and tell each color how deep it's going to cut. And that's ultimately how it knows to generate that plane. So to get to that, uh, we're going to go ahead and flip the page five. And to access power settings, it's the same as with a print out a document. You're going to go to file, print, go down to setup, and preferences. And this is where the two machines kind of branch off from one another. The 151 is the newer machine, so it's got an updated interface here. The 121 is an older machine, it's got a uh, kind of outdated interface. Uh, the document does display them separately here. But all the information being plugged in here is the exact same, it's just laid out a little bit differently on the other machine. What I'm going to do is go over this section of the screen here, because this is where we're going to enter all of this data. Looking here, we have the colors. These are the same order they were on page three. The next column here is mode. Mode is you telling the laser cutter what this color value does when it starts cutting. There are four options under mode. So if you select a color that you want to assign it for, it activates a drop down over here. Under this here, the drop down has four values. There is rast, vect, rast, vect, and skip. Going through these values, rast vect here is the only yes. mode that we will not utilize in this cut. The reason we bypass the rast vect is because what this color will do is take anything similar to this color and lump all the rast here and all the vector to the same power, same speed settings. The problem with this is the um, raster and vector have drastically different power and speed settings assigned to them. Raster cuts are able to move at 100% of the uh, speeds machine because raster is only moving in a horizontal motion. However, vector, we do not want to exceed 25%. Any higher than that, you're going to start to see one thing here. And what happens is the cuts start to look really shaky looking. I'll pass this around so you get a really close look at it. But the thing you want to pay attention to on this side is the bottom couple lines here. The lines actually start to break apart. They actually start to shift in place. What's happening there is the machine is moving so quickly, the laser head is actually slipping on the gantry track. And with that happening, it's actually going to mess with the calibration position on this bed. If it no longer knows where it's positioned, it can actually start to um, cause uh, collisions within that bed enclosure there. Whenever the machine is finished cutting, it wants to return to the home position, which is the upper right corner of the bed. Now, if it had slipped backwards during the cut process, when it goes to return, it's actually going to slam itself to the back of the machine. This is why we need to split up these two settings so we have a lot more control over what's happening with those RAST and what's happening with those back settings. I'll pass that around so you guys can get a close look at it. Why do they even have it on there? Um, if you're really careful, but because we're dealing primarily with students, students don't know, they're not experts in the machine. If I were to do it, you know, I could probably you know, get it to get a cut right, but students who have only used this maybe one or twice before, we don't want them to break a $20,000 piece of shit. So <laughs> that's why we just preach, don't even look at it. Um, so we go primarily with RAST or VECT, and then skip is self-explanatory, just skips the color. Uh, next, we have the percent power being used, the percent of speed being supplied, and this is where that PPI comes into play. So PPI stands for pulse per inch. The laser is not a continuous beam, pulsing many, many times during the cutting process which means the higher the value for PPI, the more pulses that happen for every inch of the cuts. If you lower this to the lowest value, the lowest value on the 120 watt is 10, this one can go all the way down to zero. But there's no reason to cut it zero because it means the laser is actually turned off. So I recommend the lowest you can go is around 10. What this will do is give you a consistent dotted line here. PPI is actually very useful as well for doing perforation lines. I've actually perforated paper using around 50 on here. Once you reach 100 and above, you get a consistent straight line all the way through. The only differences are in the higher numbers, you get a lot more burning on the line because you have a lot more pulses condensed into that one in space. Now, sometimes this is beneficial. When you're dealing with materials like a clear, uh, clear acrylic, you want a nice smooth edge to that acrylic. And this is achieved by having a much higher pulse value. With materials like wood, you don't want it to do a higher value because it burns a lot more on that edge. So with wood, you might want to use a lower number, like around 200, 250, something like that. And with a, you know, a, a materials of acrylic, you use the higher values. Uh, whenever students come in here to cut, we never leave them in here blind. We always give them some kind of a stepping stone to go off of. And that's actually where these binders come into play. What these binders are, these are material settings that also have samples of the material within them. So what I've done here is I've designed it in a way where they have the settings here, but it also gives you a preview of what's going to happen with the settings. Now, one thing I 
you know, preach every time is these are not exact settings. You always need to come in here with a mindset that I need to test these settings out before I send everything through. Because if you just come in here, plug it in, and then do your cutting, well, you don't want to find out at the very end of a 45 minute session that nothing got through. And I've seen that happen a lot more than it should. But what these uh, finders are useful for is you can come in here, like let's say you want to cut foam core. Somehow that got out of order. Yeah, um, in, in most facilities, they do not allow you to cut foam core. Luckily, we do have adequate ventilation system set up here, which is able to vent out a lot of the smells. Uh, materials like this, we do have them. Yeah, it's, <laughs> this is one of those materials that's unfortunately it's a little more easily damageable. Uh, so we've got like foam core in here. We've got materials like masonites, um, plywood, you know, standard materials like that. And just recently, we've started to add materials like our vegetable tan leather, which is a recent approval here. We've got um, wool felt, which if you can, I would avoid cutting that on. It just smells absolutely terrible. But what's, what's nice here is people come in here and say they need to cut a certain depth into a material. Well, they can see that the settings supplied here, you know, 70% power, and it's only still kind of just touching the surface. You need it to go halfway through start to look at these settings and then change those settings around. So maybe 70 is not enough, bring it to 100. 100 is still not enough, start to slow it down. That way you can have a lot more time for that laser to cut into the material. So it's a really great stepping off point for these materials. So when you say test? Yep. What? Test, how usually test? how I test it is I'll do like, probably something about half the size of these circles here. Okay. Uh, you know, like let's say I need a certain depth, the ratcheting rig of something half that size, see how deep it's going or if I need to see if something's going to cut all the way through, do, do a similar shape to these here, or you can actually run a portion of the file and pause it while it's cutting and see if it's cutting the way you expect it to. If it doesn't, stop you know, and change those settings. Yep, because you, yeah, you really you don't want to get too far into something and realize that nothing works. Well, can you raster engrave on the plastic material too, like on the mirrored acrylic or acrylic? Oh yeah. Or, the and way just leave a texture on it? Or? Yeah, so let's flip over to... Here's acrylic here. So acrylic, yep, it, it's gonna do it there. Mirrored acrylic is the one that's a little bit different. Um, we do not allow them to cut with a mirrored side face up. Um, the reason is we don't want anything too rough light up. Now the laser itself is not a straight beam; it's more of a honey, uh, honey or a hourglass shape. Sorry. So it comes and reflects. Now the reflection it would obviously reflect out in a cone shape. So it's not going to go firing back directly into the machine, but a reflection of that laser could still damage other components like the belt system. So what we do with this is they do all the engraving on the back of the material. Huh. So, so yep, so if you're doing mirror acrylic, you got to mirror your image. So that way you can still do these cuts here, but it's all going to happen on the back of the material. Um, our material is putting uh, in cardboard, so I'm going to flip back to that section there. And I'm going to go ahead and just type the settings according to the binder. And we'll go ahead and do this the same order I did the original <coughs> setup. In this case, orange and cyan are both going to cut all the way through the material. So, um, both selected according to the binder. We do 75 power, 15 for speed, and 1,000 PPI. These are vector cuts, so the pen mode must be set to vector. Next, magenta is going to be the uh, deep engraving for the wings here. So, I'm going to go ahead and take our deeper settings here in the middle. At 14% power, 16 for speed, 500 PPI, pin mode to vect, and set. Next, blue, really light detail engraving. So finder, we've got a really light faint engraving there at four power, 16 speed, 500 PPI, pin mode vect, set. Yellow, green, red should be skipped as well. And black is going to be our raster engraving. Um, there's a couple reasons we do it for um, black. It, uh, with black, as I mentioned before, if black does not recognize a color, that color will automatically shift to the black mode. If the laser cutter does not recognize anything as a vector line, it automatically will shift it to the black mode. This means any images, gradations, any heavy lines of any other color, black included will all be automatically thrown to this category here. So that's the best one that works for raster engraving. The other way you can think of it here is raster always happens first. 
So we should always make sure it's the very first thing that's tabled here. So let's go ahead and just do those settings for the raster. Got 50% power, 100 for speed, 250 for PPI, pen mode, rest, and set. At this point, all of the settings are typed in. It's a great idea to have one of the lab monitors now come over and double check these because a small typo during this process could actually start a fire during the cutting process. So it's very important to have these settings verified. Once they give you the approval, we're gonna hit OK. We hit print. On the final screen here, we've got the preview here. It's gonna look like it's rotated 90 degrees. It's just how the laser uh, print driver set. Uh, make sure auto rotate is checked. And as long as you know, all that stuff looks right, it's gonna cut correctly over here. At this point, we want to hold off on prints. We don't want to hit print yet. Um, we could on this machine. The old machine, it actually just clogs up the print queue. Um, on this machine, we could set it and do, do another interface, but we, please don't do it yet. Wait until the machine's warmed up and ready.